Hello, everyone, and thanks a lot for having me. I just want to say thanks to my co-authors for letting me share our recent re research with the community. Just to give you a bit of background uh, about this project. This project has gone through many challenges, and what was meant to be a relatively straightforward two-year postdoc turned out to encounter a global pandemic, a cancelled field season on the day of departure with the equipment already shipped north, uh, between the team, we have four new baby girls and one new baby boy. Not all of them are mine, thankfully. Um, and three and a half years later, we're finally very excited to present some uh, results and findings. And we'd just like to thank the Weston's Family Foundation for funding this project. So let's get started. Uh, so most of you are probably very much aware of what a subglacial lake is. And I do know there's been some debates in the past about the de definition of a subglacial lake. Uh, so I definitely don't want to go get into that on my first slide. So let's just keep it simple and say they're a body of water under an ice mass. And um, you need a couple of factors in place for a subglacial lake to exist, exist, a low in the bed topography, somewhere where water can pool and collect to form a lake, for example, a bedrock trough. Um, and you need either warm basal conditions for the water to be in its liquid form. So this could come from the insulation uh, and pressure of overlying ice sheets, say thick ice, uh, geothermal heat from, from below, uh, frictional heat generated by fast flowing ice streams and outlet glaciers, or surface water injection, say through like crevasses and moulins, um, or if the basal thermal state is cold based and there's no surface water injection, then a source of salinity to depress the freezing point. Now, there are two kinds of subglacial lakes, uh, active lakes, and which they drain and refill, and stable lakes, which are not observed to fill or, or drain. And so in this talk, we're going to focus only on stable uh, subglacial lakes. So the most commonly used method used to detect stable subglacial lakes is airborne radar. This has great spatial coverage, but it does have some limitations, which we'll talk about later. Um, then we have ground-based methods, such as active source seismic and electromagnetics. Uh, here's your seismic and your electromagnetics. There's the uh, radar here. Um, and these provide uh, acoustic properties and an understanding of how conductive the subsurface is, which can give you an information on the salinity of the water. And then finally, there's direct access by a drilling, which can be complex, and especially if you're drilling through thick ice masses. And as you can imagine, this is a point measurement, so you do want to be pretty sure of your target before you drill. So here's the current global subglacial lake inventory and it's categorized by method of identification. So this data has been um, taken from Livingston and others 2022 publication, which uses previously published inventories, such as the one shown here in this slide, and new data observations to identify new targets. So this is, as I said, has been characterized by method of identification. Uh, the Yellow Lakes are have been identified by ice surface elevation change and are active lakes which we won't discuss in this talk the red lakes have been identified by radar alone so no other observations for example no flat ice surface or no geophysical data observation like seismic or electromagnetics and these are stable lakes uh, this accounts for 76 percent of the current inventory the Black Lakes have multiple observations, so there's not too many of them around. You can see there's two here in Greenland. Uh, there's a bunch in the Antarctic. You can just see them uh, around here. Um, and then finally, the Blue Lakes are the lakes that have been drilled. And this is six out of the 773 document, uh, documented lakes in, this, in the inventory. So in all cases, Geophysical methods are non-unique, so there are multiple interpretations which could fit a single observation. And at this point, I do want to direct you all to Slack's brilliant IGS seminar, uh, which I think was a couple of years ago, and at this YouTube link, which discusses in detail the limitations of radar data and other solutions which could fit one's radar observations. So I'm not going to try and summarize that in this talk, um, just touch upon it a tiny bit. Um, so, but please do check out this video for more information on that. 
Um, but however, the non-uniqueness of res interpretations can be overcome by using complementary geophysical surveys such as seismic and or electromagnetic methods. So this Venn diagram shows that seismic, electromagnetic methods and radar data are all sensitive to different material properties of the subsurface. And they do have different resolution capabilities. So therefore, by combining all three methods, we can determine more reliably if, the, if there's subglacial water present or not. In this application, seismic methods are the only technique to have a unique solution for an ice water interface apart from direct access via drilling. Um, so this is, in se seismic terms, it's a negative polarity reflection at the ice lake interface and a reflection coefficient of around minus 0 0.4, which we'll go into a little bit more detail in this talk. Um, so therefore, when, a, when available, seismic evidence is key for confirming the presence of a subglacial lake. So to date, there are only six subglacial lakes uh, which have complementary published seismic data acquired over the lakes. So here it's Bostock, uh, Subglacial Lake Whelan's, South Pole, Ellsworth, Lago CC, I don't know if I said that right, uh, apologies if not, and uh, Northwest uh, Lake in Northwest Greenland. Uh, there may be more seismic data acquired over lakes in recent years that hasn't yet been published. I do know there's one in the Antarctic, which is not yet uh, published. But if I have missed any other published lakes with published seismic over them, then please let me know because I'd love to update um, this, in, this little inventory here. So of these six lakes, Bostock and Whelan's have, have been accessed and confirmed uh, to be lakes and uh, drilled. Ellsworth and Lago CEC they are up to 150 meters to 300 meters thick, so thick lakes, and they do have very clean and clear primary reflections at the ice water interface in the seismic data. So in comparison, the South Pole Lake and the Northwest Greenland Lake are relatively thin lakes, so less than 50 meters, uh, let's say that's relatively thin, um, and thought to have cold basal conditions. So here in this talk, we are going to revisit three predicted coal-based stable lakes that have previously been interpreted as subglacial lakes from radar data. Now, these sites were chosen as they're thought to have similar cold basal temperatures. They, uh, so South Pole is minus nine degrees. These are estimated, obviously. Uh, Northwest Greenland, minus 12 to minus 14, and Devon Ice Cap, minus 10 to minus 14 degrees. They are relatively thin lakes, so I mean meters thick rather than hundreds of meters thick, and they all have multiple geophysical data observations. So for the Northwest Greenland and the South Pole lakes, they have previously published radar and seismic data observations, which we'll revisit. For Devon Ice Cap, we're going to show new seismic and electromagnetic observations and revisit the previously published radar data analysis. Okay, so let's get started with Devon Ice Cap in the Canadian Arctic. So we're up here. Um, now, this was the original and main aim of uh, my postdoc research. And we did present this at AGU last year, of which some of the slides have been recycled. So I do apologize if anyone's at the AGU talk. I apologize in advance for the recycled slides. Um, so airborne radar surveys flown in 2016 and 2018 gave evidence for the existence of a hypersaline subglacial lake complex beneath the center of Devon Ice Cap. This, um, at this location, the ice is 760 meters thick and the estimated basal ice temperature is minus 14 degrees Celsius. Radar observations were characterized by high reflectivity and specularity or relatively high reflectivity and specularity combined with hydrological modeling, which showed, showed that water could pool and collect in this bed low, uh, suggested uh, there may be a, sub, a subglacial lake, hypersaline subglacial lake, and that was the most likely interpretation. It needed to be hypersaline um, for the water to exist in liquid form at these cold basal temperatures. 
So this motivated a ground-based geophysical survey, which was conducted in May of 2022, with the main aim to distinguish whether there was a lake or not. Uh, and the techniques we took were active source seismic, time domain electromagnetics, and magnetotelluric methods. We required, so this is our bed elevation here, uh, showing you the bed trough, uh, and this is the outline of the proposed lake. Um, here on the up on the plateau, there were also high, relatively high reflectivity, uh, which was a proposed brine network uh, outlined here. So we acquired two lines, one across the lake and into the brine network, this line A, and one along the long axes of the lake, line B. So the team spent one week in Resolute Bay, which is here. So this is Devon Island. Uh, Devon Ice Cap is here. This is near the summit. And this is Resolute Bay um, here. So the team spent a week in Resolute Bay testing the geophysical equipment and packing up and sorting the camp equipment with the amazing help from the Polar Continental Shelf Program team. So we, massive thanks to them for all their support and help. Uh, the team took four Twin Otter flights to get to this uh, summit um, and to get four tons of equipment up onto the ice cap, uh, which is quite a lot of equipment. Um, and that's where we set up base camp, which is near the summit of the ice cap. Uh, the field team lived in the ice cap for a month. Um, and th that consisted of, this is Eric, James, Tim, and Brittany. So this is a photo here of base camp near the summit. Uh, which the field team will tell you is not 100% representative of what the summit of Devon Ice Cap is like most of the time. I hope uh, you can hear that. I'm sure I ticked the sign box, but if you not, didn't, it was very windy. There are many days where the field team were stuck in the tent trying to keep warm and waiting for storms to pass, but they did an amazing job of picking weather windows and getting out when it was good at all times of the day, because there's 24 hour daylight in May and, and to acquire a brilliant data set. So massive thanks and well done to them. So here's a photo of our seismic setup. We had a weight drop source on the back of a sledge towed by a snowmobile. We also had a hammer and plate source, um, which Tim managed to break on the last day, um, <laughs> thankfully. So if you ever use a hammer and plate, a sledge hammer and plate as a source, please bring, bring a spare. Um, and we used 48 channels with 40 hertz geophones. Here's our transient electromagnetic setup. We had used a low frequency vertical component receiver, um, and we used the Geonics ProTem 67 transmitter, uh, which is powered by two generators run in parallel to pump 25 amps around a 500 meter loop. So those two are our active source methods. And then we had magnetotelluric method, which is a passive method. And we use the Phoenix MTU-5C system. So here's a photo of the system. These are the electrodes here, the four electrodes. And these are the magnetometers, X, Y, and Z. And um, so the team would set them out and then leave them running for 24 hours and come back and collect the data. Okay, so let's look at some data. Um, under Devon. So here is our process seismic line, uh, line A across the lake, uh, across the lake. And if I just put on my inter interpretation to point you to the reflections that we're looking at, um, you can see the here is the um, up on the plateau, we got down on the steeply dipping valley floor into the trough, uh, where we observe two reflections here. Uh, this is the base of the ice and the second reflector below and then uh, this continues along this up the southern flank where we don't see a termination of reflector two onto reflector one you see you see they run in parallel um to each other so then if we just go to line b which is uh, across the lake along the long axis of the lake uh, you see a very smooth very smooth face of the uh, uh, bed topography uh, with that second reflector uh, below. So, but the crux to understanding our seismic data is what is the ice bed reflection showing us? And to, in order to understand that, we need to have an accurate understanding of the polarity of our data, where, whether we have something acoustically soft, like 
water under the ice cap or acoustically hard like a uh, rock or consolidated or frozen sediment. Uh, and this can be easily misunderstood, especially if there are thin layers and the reflected and the re primary reflections are have interference, but wavelets are being interfered. So to try to understand the polarity, we use synthetic modeling um, and we compared real data or real shock gathers to our synthetic models of a lake versus um, so something acoustically soft versus a package of, say, consolidated sediment, which is acoustically hard. Um, and we zoomed in, if you zoom in on the signature expected for an ice water interface, which is a negative acoustic impedance, um, and an ice rock interface or consolidated sediment or something hard, that's a positive acoustic impedance. You can see that our uh, negative acoustic impedance is a negative Ricker wavelet. You see this positive, negative, positive, and the positive acoustic impedance is a positive Ricker wavelet. So this negative, positive, kick, negative. And when we compare this to our seismic data at Devon to the base ice interface, we see we have a positive polarity, a positive acoustic impedance. We have, there's no indication of um, uh, uh, water or a, um, a negative acoustic impedance here. So this is sh showing that there's likely something hard down there and not and potentially not a lake. So with this in mind, we let's move over to the electromagnetic data and see what that's showing. Here we have our um, plot, our transient electromagnetic data, so our active source, and then our magnetic telluric data uh, all together. This is apparent resistivity versus frequency, and frequency is a proxy for depth. So here we've got high frequencies, which are around the base of the ice and all the way down to our low frequencies, which is about 10 kilometers depth. And uh, the MT data are the squares and the stars are the TEM data. And you can see that it's really neat. They, there's uh, data points, uh, most frequencies, and you can see how neatly the TEM data overlaps into the MT data quite nicely. So we're covering all most depths here, which is brilliant. And this is the acquired data. So if we plot where we would expect a hypersaline lake to plot or a package of saturated sediments uh, using synthetic modeling, um, they're plotting away down here. This is very different to what we to our actual data. And what our actual data is showing us is a very resistive subsurface, greater than a thousand ohm meters. If we had a hypersaline lake, you're looking at around 0 0.1 to 1 ohm meters. Um, so this is very different. If we show our 2D electromagnetic inversion, so this is through line A across across the lake here, we've got um, we're looking at from zero to five kilometers depth. This is our ice layer here, which is ice is very resistive, and then you can see beneath the ice we also have a pretty resistive body. So you're looking at blues, which is around 10,000 ohmmeters to 1,000 ohmmeters, um, all the way down to about three kilometers depth. So there's no indication here of a conductive body that you would expect if you had a if you had a hypersaline if you had a lake. So with this in mind, these new observations and results in mind, we went back and had a look at the radar reflectivity data um, to see what was going on there. And um, originally, in the original publications, the attenuation rates were derived directly from the radar data using linear regression fitting. Uh, and the attenuation rates were around 21.8 plus or minus 8 dB per kilometer. So it's quite a big error, error and rel quite high attenuation rate for potentially cold ice. Um, whereas if we looked at the Arrhenius modeled attenuation rates and this Arrhenius temperature relationship, the attenuation rates uh, predict, uh, estimated in the lake area, or more like 15.6 dB per kilometer. So this is a lot lower than what was originally applied. Uh, therefore, if we apply these new attenuation rates to the radar data and compare it to the original reflectivity data, you can see this is the original. Um, and here is our reanalysis of the re, um, relative reflectivity. 
the high, relative high reflectivities in this bedrock trough disappear. You can see that here. And the lake now does not reach the reflectivity threshold. And one may not have uh, interpreted this as a subglacial lake uh, if this attenuation, if these attenuation rates had been applied, um, which is so much easier said than done. And hindsight is such a wonderful thing. <laughs> so this is just highlighting where that sensitivity analysis on attenuation rates is pretty important when you're looking at subglacial water and subglacial lake identification. Uh, so this unexpected result at Devon motivated us to take a look at the proposed subglacial lake in northwest Greenland, which is just a hop across uh, Baffin Bay from Devon Ice Cap. So Devon is just sitting around here. Here, the proposed lake is predicted to have very cold basal conditions, so minus 12 to minus 14 degrees, and the ice is around 800 meters thick. Um, there's also radar and seismic data, so it's pretty similar setup uh, situation to what we have at Devon Ice Cap. This lake was proposed in 2013 um, in this paper here. Um, so here, you, this is a bed elevation. You can see here, let's look at L2. This is a proposed lake, and this is our ra radar line A. So if you look, at, if I direct you to here, you can see L2 here, which is relatively high. It's a flat spot and relatively high reflectivity. Uh, but I just want to highlight that also up on this plateau up here, there's also relatively high reflectivity, which we can't ignore. And it's very similar uh, observations to what we had at Devon as well. So in 2021, the results of newly acquired seismic data were published and concluded the existence of a lake. Here, the seismic data was made open source, which is brilliant um, and a great practice. So thanks to the team for doing this. Uh, so we decided to download the data and take a look and compare to uh, our Devon results, expecting the opposite seismic signature at the ice base to what we had at Devon. However, we found that the ice bed reflection in the proposed lake area has the same signature as that at Devon and the same signature as that of a positive acoustic impedance, so this uh, positive Ricker wavelet. Um, which is opposite to that expected if there was a lake. So here it looks like there's something acoustically hard beneath the ice cap in this location. So why did we differ in seismic polarity assessments? Um, we reached out to the authors and the co-authors of the research and we had some excellent discussions um, about this analysis. So I really thank the Greenland team, Northwest Greenland team for these brilliant discussions. Um, and giving the time taken for all of these. So thank you. Um, and we think that it's likely that an incorrect source wavelet was used to create synthetic models, which caused the potential misinterpretation of the polarity. So in all honesty, determining the phase and polarity of seismic data sets over ice masses is not documented that well in current literature. And I find it really hard and quite confusing when I was trying to understand the Devon seismic data, especially when I was trying to fit a lake to um, the data. Um, so, and currently in, in the glaciology community, conflicting wavelets, so minimum phase versus a ricker, are used as a source signature uh, in modeling for an impulse source, so like at explosives or a hammer and plate. And then these are compared to acquired shock gathers in order to determine the polarity of the ice bed reflection. But these provide different interpretations of the phase and polarity of the data. So which one do we do and which signature do, should we expect? So after going back to the basics of seismic wave propagation for an impulse source and comparing synthetic seismic models to um, known seismic data sets acquired over known interfaces. So for example, an ice shelf where you've got ice and water, um, for an impulse source, like a hammer and plate or an explosives or a weight drop, a minimum phase wavelet should be used as the source wavelet. And then our primary reflection wavelet at the bay, ice base interface should be a Ricker, is a Ricker wavelet where the interface is picked at the start of the wavelet, which is the beginning of the first side lobe here. You can see that here. 
And this is what we use for the seismic analysis at Devon and the reanalysis here in the Northwest Greenland site. So with the knowledge of a likely positive acoustic impedance at the ice bed interface um, at L2, at the site of L2, we had a look at the open source um, radar data available in this area and found that the Palmer, the 2013 study used an attenuation rate of 22.5 dB per kilometer, whereas a linear regression fit shows around 14 dB per kilometer. And then the Arrhenius temperature model gives you values of between 14 and 18 dB per kilometers. So it could be that, again, here, um, the attenuation rates may have applied may have been uh, slightly high and lower attenuation rates could have been applied to the data. So I do know that the Northwest Greenland team have acquired more seismic data over this site since this, these publications. So watch this space as there's more to come and it'll be really interesting to hear and see the results from their new seismic data observations. Okay, let's now go to the final cold based lake where there's resin seismic data. So this uh, South Pole Lake in the Antarctic. Uh, so there are two interpretations came out of the radar data for the, this lake. One, that it's a lake, and two, uh, that it's a frozen lake, or basically the radar reflectivity was too weak to indicate free water. Uh, and then the, basically along the uh, extrapolation to the bed of a nearby in glacial borehole temperature suggests cold basal conditions, so minus nine degrees at the bed. Um, so it was a bit of a conundrum. So in 2008, seismic data was acquired over the lake to resolve these issues and concluded the existence of a lake. However, it, after reanalyzing this paper um, with the Devon and the Northwest Greenland sites in mind, um, if we take a look at the ice bottom, so the ice lake interface, we see that here it's showing a positive Ricker wavelet. Um, so this is matching a positive polarity, uh, which is opposite to what you'd expect to see if you did have a subglacial lake. Furthermore, one would suggest uh, that one you would think that if you had a lake, you would have a polarity reversal between the ice water interface and then the water sediment interface. So the lake bottom, which is number two here, whereas here we're also observing a positive Ricker wavelet. Um, so we don't see, I don't we see this polarity reversal here. Um, and then finally, the lake ghost, where the signal bounces off the surface first before it goes down into this subsurface, um, you'd expect that to be the opposite of your lake reflection, which should be a positive Ricker wavelet, but here it's a negative. So it's all, this is all pointing towards potentially a, a misidentification here, and there's actually something hard under uh, South Pole, and it may have been misidentified. However, um, this data set is not open source, um, unfortunately. Um, so it'd be really brilliant if anyone had access to this data set. I'd love to have a uh, look at the raw seismic shot gathers here. Uh, it'd be really great uh, to collaborate with that um, to confirm this analysis. So please, if anyone knows about where this data set is, then please let me know. Okay, next slide. There we go. Okay, so let's move on to the discussion. So why is the accurate identification of subglacial lakes important? Well, they're important parameters in predictive models, such as basal thermal conditions and geothermal heat flux. So these use subglacial lake databases to constrain certain parameters. For example, in basal thermal conditions, uh, if you have a known lake uh, models, if you had a known lake, you may one may fix basal thermal state to be uh, likely thawed, whereas if that lake has been misidentified, then you're propagating an uncertainty in your subglacial lake identification into these basal thermal condition models. Um, and that's the same for geothermal heat flux. If you're fixing parameters because there's a known lake and yet that lake may have been misidentified, 
then these uncertainties in your lake detection are propagated across multiple scientific disciplines. And this directly impacts our understanding of our global scale processes, such as ice sheet ev um, evolution. The subglacial lakes are also considered to be potential analogues for sub ice habitats and other planetary bodies where water may exist. So the techniques that we use to identify lakes on Earth are used on, on other planetary bodies, uh, basically radar, to detect subglacial water. And at this point, I will refer you back to uh, Slavik's brilliant talk who goes into this in a lot more detail. So if you want more information about, about that, please um, go and visit his talk. So going forward, uh, it is important to understand and discuss the limitations of sing single geophysical observations when identifying subglacial water. So many existing radar data sets could be reanalyzed, Re reflectivity sensitivity tests with respect to attenuation rates and surrounding basal conditions could be undertaken to further investigate some of the more suspicious radar identified lakes, in particular the ones identified in areas thought to have cold basal conditions. Now, at this point, I also want to point out that um, these references here, which go into a lot more detail uh, about radar attenuation rates, and we've only just touched the surface here in this study. So I've gone back to this Venn diagram to highlight that multiple data observations are required where possible. Over the past decade, accessibility to, surf accessibility to the surface of ice caps and ice sheets has greatly increased due to dramatic improvement in technology, such as motorized and survival equipment. Weather predictions are getting better, communications are getting better, and we have warming surface temperatures. So it is possible and feasible to conduct more seismic and electromagnetic methods on ice masses. I'm not saying it's easy, and I know the field team will, will agree with me, and I know many of you out there will also agree with me who've done lots of field work. Um, but as a community, it would be great if we could think about this going forward when planning field campaigns and data acquisition. Um, so just to summarize, most of so 76% of the 773 subglacial lakes in the current global inventory have been detected using only radar data, so with no other observations. And here we have shown that three proposed subglacial lakes thought to exist in cold basal conditions and explored using multiple independent geophysical techniques are unlikely to contain water. The water temperatures, um, just as a point, the water temperatures in subglacial lakes accessed today do ranges from minus three degrees Celsius to 4.7 degrees Celsius, and they're mainly comprised of brackish or fresh water. To date, no hypersaline subglacial lakes with depressed freezing points have been directly accessed. Now, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just I'm just uh, stating that that fact there. And also, some of you might be thinking, well, three subglacial lakes are not representative of the global inventory. But just remember that these three lakes are some of the very few lakes which have multiple data observations and published as previously as lakes. So, with the potential misidentification of these three lakes in mind, there does remain no secondary geophysical evidence for such as seismic observations for the presence of stable subglacial lakes in areas that are predicted to have cold basal environments. Um, therefore, we are wondering if the prevalence of stable subglacial lakes has been overestimated, in particular, those identified exclusively from radar data and have predicted cold basal environments. So we suggest as a community, we move towards implementing more sensitivity analysis, quantifying uncertainty and reporting results probabilistically so that we can effectively inform our understanding of these sensitive and globally important systems. So uh, thanks a lot for your time. And I just wanted to point out our acknowledgements here um, and before I point, before I open the floor to questions and discussions, I just wanted to apologize if you heard a screaming baby in the background, <laughs> or if I answer any questions badly, I, we have a nine week old baby and so very sleep deprived and have baby brain. So I do apologize in advance if I sound like I'm talking gaga. 
uh, but I'm sure we'll have some good questions and discussions now. So I'd like to hand it back to Avi for any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. There was no sign of screaming that I heard whatsoever. And uh, uh, I think that was an extremely clear and well explained talk. So I don't didn't see any evidence of baby brain either. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. So um, what we usually do with questions, I'm reminding myself here is we just ask people to put an indication in the chat that they would like to uh, ask a question or you can raise your hand uh if you can find the right button on zoom to do that um phil's asking if you could put your references in the chat i'm guessing that's a request to you sean rather than uh, to the uh, audience in general so roger you've got a question do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question yes i will thank you taby and and siobhan smashing to be in touch again um, really good talk and fantastic work, th this kind of forensic uh, re-examination. Quick question about the seismic, unsurprisingly. D did any of the, the layouts that you had the chance to process have enough offsets and so on to give you uh, interval velocity estimates? Because hypersaline water, um, a relatively new revelation from me, is really seismically fast like 1700 1800 and um doesn't quite produce all the the, the standard things you think if you you know you're just look, looking at a, a standard bit of ocean or a freshwater lake yeah thanks roger i knew you'd ask a really good seismic question <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> um okay yeah absolutely so basically no we did not um have long offsets so we were mainly focused on normal incident uh reflection method uh and to get uh be good coverage so a 2d line um we had when we were acquiring data we did have the other methods the em methods in mind so with that in mind we were mainly focused on just um getting the spatial coverage through the, across the lake. So we wanted to characterize the plateau, the trough, and then that southern flank to hopefully see it uh, pinch out. Um, we, and then we had the other methods in order to constrain further our seismic, so like where we could get potentially estimate of salinity from the conductivity structure. So um, no, we did not have long offsets. Okay, well, it sounds like uh some some good avenues for forward work and i've put a direct suggestion to you uh, about that uh, missing data set i've put it direct to you in the chat about okay. somewhere you might ask brilliant thanks roger thanks once again cheers are there any other questions for siobhan um i'm kind of intrigued myself to know um what you think is causing these flat areas if they're not in fact on the on the radar um radar grams if they're not in fact lakes because they've always seemed quite compelling i've I've never actually had a radar gram that uh, we've interpreted with as being a lake at the bottom but it, they do look quite compelling in in figures and diagrams and so on yeah uh, that's also a really good question um and the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I haven't actually thought in that too much. I've kind of come from this of a geophysical background and not a geological background. Um, I guess we could look at. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not even going to try and um, gag at that. <laughs> Sorry, Tavi. No problem at all. It was just intriguing because I was just sort of wheeling round in my brain. Well, what happens if? you know, like 50% of all the lakes are misinterpreted. But that means then there are flat things underneath lots of bits of ice that, uh, you know. Uh, Trevor, yeah. you've got a question. So do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, well, thanks, Tavi. Um, I don't really know much about this, but I thought some of these subglacial lakes were identified from just the flat surface of the ice sheet above them. Uh, yeah, there. I think there are some subglacial lakes identified with only 
uh, flat surfaces above them. I haven't looked into them, to be honest. I've mainly just looked, we've mainly just taken a look at the radar identified flake. Um, I'm not, I'm thinking that they're all mainly radar identified. They've been, I mean, there's so much radar data out there, isn't there, that think that any flat ice surface would probably have a radar line over the top of it. Um, so I'm not too sure on how to answer that. And um, maybe Anya knows more about this than me. Um, but um, sorry, I, I'm I'm not. I can't answer that very much better. Well, how about the, the three that you did look at? Do they have a, a markedly flat surface um, where you were? Um, so yeah, so those three, they. I don't think they had anything uh, that was remarkably fat, flat. I know that Devin definitely didn't because we took a look at that, so we couldn't see anything. But it's definitely something that could be looked at further. But we couldn't see anything at Devon. Um, uh, North. I don't think the Northwest Greenland and the so South Pole Lake did. But again, um, I'm looking at this from the geophysical data observations of the radar the seismic and electromagnetic methods um, and maybe someone out there knows can answer that better and knows that there is but I don't think there is at the Northwest Greenland site and the South Pole site. Okay thank you. Are there any more questions for Siobhan? Um... I was actually delighted to see TM data being used for real. Um, we've tried using TM and didn't get results that were uh, persuadable that we could understand them. So uh, we, we never managed to do anything with it. Yeah, it, it was um, it was actually, a, yeah, it had its ups and downs, but it once you got the data, it's, um, yeah, it was, we were really delighted to, it was, yeah, really good. So I'd really advocate TEM going forward as well. It does work. <laughs> Paco, you have a question. Do you want to? Uh, yes, um, it was really great talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was amazing. Oh, thank uh, you. No, no, and I'm worried about the, I mean, your conclusions are really uh, strong conclusions in the sense that uh, many things that have been identified as lakes could be not uh, the case. But I'm just uh, curious because I'm not, uh, I have not done any seismic work. Uh, so I'm, so I just wonder how do you deploy your uh, recept, uh, receptors, the uh, geophones, on the snow fern, so to get a good coupling. So do you to get sufficient energy? Do you bury them under a certain amount of in the in the snow or fern, or how do you do that? Because there are plenty of uh, there are forty, I think you said uh, receptors. Yeah, we, yeah. We just, um, yeah, you're right. We just, that was a consideration uh, when we were planning. Um, we were thinking about, oh, what if there's, um, you know, fern heter uh, I know there's thought of fern heterogeneities, uh, which could attenuate your our seismic signal. Um, but we just, it, I mean, so the surface of Devon Ice Cap is, um, it's hard snow, hard fur, it's hard. So we just buried this, we didn't, we just planted them and buried them with some snow. And um, the coupling was good enough uh, to get uh, the signal, the signal through the fern. Now there was, I have to say, there was um, strong ground roll. So we did observe strong ground roll, um, which, but at our further offsets, which weren't long enough to do AVO analysis, for example, but at our far offsets, we did manage to image the base of the ice um, quite nicely. So we did um, just plant them on the surface when covered with them some snow, uh, but we did suffer some um, bat, we did suffer with ground roll. Uh, so I can imagine if we had spent more time digging them deeper in might have improved that, uh, but we were okay with just having them on the surface. Okay, thank you. Frank, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Well, I could. But it's it's very simple. I mean, I I love this this talk. I love it. The 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 challenge. So the 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 lakes you looked at were evidently in areas that were presumably more much colder. So ten minus ten minus forty. Um, 
but of course uh, you have a lot of lakes that are presumably in areas in the thicker ice that are much warmer or these reflectors that you see in radar then likely more correct interpretations is, is, is the fact that you see a flat reflector just our, our human interpretation of saying well this looks like this so it must be that uh, yeah, so can, sorry, can you, what, what's the question there? Well, the sorry. question is that, that the, the, the flat reflectors that you see are in, in many subglacial lakes that are situated uh, under thicker ice and therefore in warmer basal conditions, yeah. are they more likely to be real subglacial lakes? Yeah. than those that are marginally in those areas that you have investigated because those lakes that you investigated were typically all in colder conditions yeah completely like that's just to absolutely yeah absolutely um you know as, as i said at the start for a subglacial lake to exist you need certain conditions um so absolutely in on those thicker where you see the flat really bright flat respect reflectors um where your ice is quite thick um, and you've you've got potential you're potentially at the pressure melting point so you have warm basal conditions then absolutely a subglacial lake could total you know could exist there's a lot of uh, ev like data uh, observations pointing towards that direction it's just in those really cold in those cold basal env environments where there's some environments where you're in the antarctic like some areas where you're there are papers published on um looking for things like the oldest ice now for the oldest ice to exist you need really really cold you want cold basal conditions uh because meltwater will um or water will ruin your old ice basically um but then in the same instance one is predicting say a hundred subglacial lakes so it just seems there may be a little bit oh we maybe need to think when we when we're identifying subglacial lakes we really do need to think about the basal conditions um, and take that into account as well um, not just that there's a flat spot there but there's a lot more work to be done i think this is only the start of it really um and there's a lot more questions to be answered so yeah thanks <laughs> oh thanks a lot it was a very lovely presentation i think it's a great kickoff of this uh, new series after the holiday season. It's really a success. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Frank, and thanks for your question. Is there a last question of Paul Siobhan, or are we, uh, are we all satisfied with our curiosity? I think that uh, that might be the end of uh, the questions, unless anyone wants to jump in. So uh, just to say that uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank you, Siobhan, for a fantastic talk. And to say that next week's talk is by Ching Zhao Lei uh, and is on inferring Antarctic ice shelf rheology with deep learning. So sorry, I have failed to get a title slide for that one to put up at the end of this talk. That's my fault. I, um, not yet quite in the cycle of um, the next talk um, in the series. So apologies for that. But I hope you'll all come to next week's talk. And thank you very much for a fantastic talk today, Siobhan. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs>